Greetings guys, John here with another video, and in this video I wanted to talk about Adventures in Middle-Earth. As you can see, I'm in a new spot. I'm actually in my living room using a different microphone and everything because, uh, well, I need to be able to work out here and also keep track of my daughter. So it just worked better. She's happier out here in the living room than she is in the office. So desk, computer desk, everything's moved out here. Anyways, that's a whole other story, although it does remind me of a piece of advice that uh, raising children is a lot like planning a campaign. You have a plan, you have a, you set goals that you want the players to reach, and then the players go off on a different divergent path. That's 100% what parenting, parenting is like. So, Anyways, I wanted to talk about Adventures in Middle-Earth and why I think it solves a lot of the problems that 5th uh, Edition has, and why I, I'm running it now and I enjoy it, and I'll probably run it again in the future once I'm done with this particular campaign. Though I might, like I've said before, be switching to a different system. There's a lot to like about Adventures in Middle-Earth. Uh, first of all, before I even ran this game, I was worried, and, and if you're a, a Tolkien fan like me, uh, you obsess over the lore, you love reading the books. I try and read the books, uh, lore, I try to reread Lord of the Rings every year or at least every other year just for the fun of it because I just, I really love the writings of Tolkien and it's been so influential on me and uh, everything like that. So when I saw Adventures in Middle Earth and I got mine as PDFs on a, on a humble, humble bundle, I can't talk right now, humble bundle, and uh, I got a bunch of the PDFs for like 20 bucks or something like that. It was a super awesome deal. I couldn't pass it up. And I've been wanting to run a Middle Earth themed campaign and game in a, in a long while. So if you're like me, you're really concerned with the lore. And if you were to run a Lord of the Rings game, you would want to make sure that you represent Tolkien's world properly, respectfully, and accurately. And so I was really worried when I downloaded these, when I, when I bought them, that... I'm gonna, I, and I did, I'm gonna reread The Lord of the Rings, I'm gonna reread The Hobbit, and I'm gonna reread The Silmarillion, so I make sure that I have a good grasp on the lore, the world, and all these sorts of things. And I'm happy to tell you that you don't really need to do that with Adventures in Middle-Earth. There is the Tale of Years within the Lore Masters book, and there's a lot of good background information on the cultures, races, <clears throat> and all those sorts of things within the Player's Handbook. And each region has its own guide that you can get as well. So there's like the Rovanion region guide, Breland region guide, a guide to Rivendell, uh, a guide to, I think there might be one for Mordor, I'm not sure. I know, I, I'm not positive, but for most regions, there is uh, a guidebook for you that gives you new enemies, uh, characters of note, so NPCs. N not real adventures, but they give you adventure seeds, although there is... Uh, there is written adventures. I'm currently taking my groups, uh, my group through the uh, Mirkwood campaign, which is like a 30-year campaign within the world, and supplementing that with some adventures, uh, some Wilderland adventures, and probably some Erebor uh, adventures in the future as well. So I'm keeping my campaign in the Mirkwood, Erebor, Lonely Mountain uh, area. But I'm happy to say that you don't have to reread the books. There is plenty of information, lore, all these sorts of things condensed into these books so that you can write a story that is accurate to Tolkien's world. And considering Tolkien's world, I think Cubicle 7 really did things right with their world building of this. They really understood uh, Lord of the Rings, they really understood Tolkien's work and world. Uh, I think it's kind of sad that these books are really hard to find now, they're out of print. If you can find PDFs online uh, or a, a hard copy, I say pick it up because they're, they're well worth it. Uh, they're really well done, really well formatted. The art is pretty good in them, and uh, the, the way it's laid out is very well done. Um, and again, Cubicle 7 did the first edition of uh, the One Ring RPG, which is getting a second edition, second edition from Free League as we talk right now. But uh, this, this is really good because fifth edition is one of the most widely played uh, editions of Dungeons and Dragons ever. So you're not going to have a hard time finding players that will Im Im immediately grasp how to play this game. So that's a plus. If you if you use one ring, it's a different system than fifth edition, obviously. And so you're going to have to, there's going to be a learning curve there with new players that aren't familiar uh, with something that's outside the D20 5e system. And so that said, there's a lot of things I like about um, 
Adventures in Middle-earth. I like the character classes. You have things like Slayer, Warrior, Scholar, uh, Wanderer, um, Warden. Uh, all, all these classes are really useful. A Scholar might sound like a class that is a spell, because there's no spellcaster class, so I like that as well. You might It might sound like a nerfed wizard where you get all this understanding of lore and mythology, but you don't have any spell casting, but it works because uh, scholars can can uh, use their hit dice to heal other people. It's kind of a mix between like the lore master, the, the lore uh, of a wizard and a cleric in a lot of ways in that they can, they're a little squishy, but they're definitely the support for the party. Uh, wardens are cool. You can, uh, you get f uh, special abilities like raising your weapon in the air and you can, um, give all your if you roll successful on your ability roll for that ability you can give it all of your party members inspiration which is really cool obviously the the 5e inspiration system um wanderer is pretty much just like a ranger a slayer is pretty much like a barbarian in regular 5e you get like rage mode and all that kind of stuff a uh, warrior is more like traditional fighter and every um class comes with different paths that the players can take if they wish. So I really like that. Uh, I also like the races. The, the ra there's pretty much only man, uh, elf, hobbit, and dwarf. But within men, you can be from Minas Tirith, you can be from Rohan, you can be a Bjorning, you can be from Lake Town, you can be a Barding from Dale. Uh, so there's a lot of different... Uh, a Brelander, you can be from Breland, from Bree. So there's a lot of different race sub races within men, and they all f have different perks and abilities, and uh, different ways to differentiate them among the race of man. There's the elves of Mirkwood, the dwarves of Erebor, and of course the hobbits of the Shire. Now I mentioned there's no spell casting class, and that's because within the lore of Lord of the Rings, uh, wizards like Gandalf and Saruman and Radagast are all Maiar, which are essentially angelic beings that have taken a physical form to act as guides for the free peoples of Middle-earth. And so they're extremely powerful. Actually, Sauron is himself a Maiar. He's on the same, you, you could say the same power level as Gandalf and Saruman in a lot of ways, and even Radagast are all from the same class of angelic beings. And so allowing players to be a wizard uh, it doesn't fit the lore of Tolkien. It doesn't fit the low magic setting of Middle Earth. I, I think maybe some people might be confused and think that Lord of the Rings is like a, a high fantasy setting. And to a degree, in a lot of ways, it is, but the magic is definitely more of a low magic, subtle sort of thing. So there's no spell casting. There is magic in a way. Uh, elves get their own sort of natural ability to do some utilitarian sort of magic, but it's not anything on the level of like casting fireball or magic missile if you're used to that in 5e. Alright, so future John here, and I realized I forgot to talk about something really important within Adventures in Middle-earth that sort of changes maybe the view that you may have on journeys within tabletop RPGs. So Adventures in Middle-earth, all of the rule books, uh, the published adventures, the region guides all give you hex maps. But you're not intended to necessarily travel from hex to hex to hex as a party, as a fellowship. Roll on each hex to see if there's an encounter there, and then play out that encounter, that random encounter. Instead, uh, you count the number of hexes that they have to travel on the map, and there's a certain number of uh, lengths of journey, so short journey, medium journey, and long journey that all have a specified amount of hex distances and you roll on a table, on a random uh, encounter table, based on that. So I think like a medium journey is like 1d2 plus 1. So you have a potential of 3, maximum 3, um, 2 or 3, or maybe it's minus 1, I don't remember. But uh, regardless, you roll on this table, and you time while journeying is a little more uh, malleable in Adventures in Middle-earth. It's not just like you spend a day on this hex, a day on this hex, a day on this hex. It's sort of like uh, you're, you're traveling 21 hexes, and in that 21 hexes, maybe here on the map, maybe you pick some arbitrary point, this event occurs, and then you rolled for a second event too. So there were supposed to be two events that occur on this journey. And then on this um, 
on, on this hex over here, maybe you just, again, arbitrarily choose, this event happens. And the events can range from good things like meeting and friendly NPCs, a, a merry troop of elves that maybe provide them sanctuary, to bad things like servants of the enemies, uh, uh, maybe an orc scouting party, something like that, spiders, who knows. Uh, they, they range in, from good to bad, they're, they're not all bad. Or, or maybe there's a, a op hunting option as well, which also brings us to different roles within Adventures in Middle-Earth Earth Journeys. So there's a guide who's kind of the leader of the journey, there's a hunter, a lookout, um, a scout, hunter, lookout, scout. Those are the four uh, jobs that can have in the party. However, I have six players in my party, and the book kind of specifies that there needs to be one person for each job, which means during journeys, there's a lot of players that don't get to do anything. So the way I home ruled this is there can be only one guide still, but there can be however many, um, however many uh, uh, other others of the of the of the other jobs. So there could be two scouts, there could be uh, two lookouts, there could be two hunters. The way I see it is within a party, if everyone has, if there's people with those relevant skills to those uh, jobs within the party, why not allow them to do it? There, you know, like the, there's one guy who volunteered for, to be the hunter. The other guy has really good uh, survival uh, survival skill abilities, but he just kind of sits at camp and lets the other guy do it. Like, no, send them both out. You're going to be more effective. That's what would happen in real life, right? So that's the way I home rule uh, the jobs. So within these journeys, maybe some of the events is there's a hunting opportunity for them to gain food, or maybe the the uh, the scout or someone like that finds some uh, athelus or healing herbs or something like that. Um, so there, there's a lot of cool stuff like that. It's not all bad, but that's how that's how I home homebrew it, and I really like this method of uh, doing journeys. It feels less tedious than you move to this hex. Does an encounter happen? No. Okay, you move to this hex. Does an encounter happen? No. And, and so I feel like this is a good balance. It is a little confusing to some players maybe who want, who may be used to that kind of traveling. And for instance, I have players ask, where on the map does this exactly happen? And in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really ma matter. It happens on your journey somewhere in there. But they want to know, I pick an arbitrary point on the map. Maybe the first event is two thirds of the way and or one third of the way through the adventure and then the second event is two thirds of the way and then they reach their their destination so it's it's not super relevant to to have that but and, and players might not get not might not be used to that but um i feel like it's less it, the encounters are more memorable and it gives you a chance to describe as a, as a lore master as a game master in middle earth tolkien was very vivid in his descriptions of middle earth and I don't always do the best job of this in my game. I need to be better at it. But uh, describing Middle Earth for your players is very important on these journeys. So the, the Lore Master's book and the Player's Handbook specify this. Uh, in a, they give you ideas of how to describe Middle Earth based on Tolkien's writing. It's very important to that mechanic of journeys as well. And I really like that. That's something I think I'll import into uh, other um games that I run that are not Adventures in Middle-Earth that have long journeys to be traveled. So I think that's pretty cool. I like that it the game forces downtime in a lot of ways. There's a whole phase called the Fellowship phase, which after the adventuring phase, which you traditionally view as uh, the adventurers are going out and crawling through a dungeon or through a forest, through Mirkwood or something like that, uh, they, the game expects players to only go adventuring maybe once or twice a year and spend the rest of the year in downtime during the fellowship phase where they can remove corruption, which is shadow points, uh, healing and uh, opening sanctuaries, influencing patrons, engaging in more roleplay aspects, um, maybe getting a holding for one of your characters uh, so that they can own a track of land, a fortress, a castle, something like that. So there's a lot of cool stuff like that, and the Fellowship phase kind of gamifies it a little bit and uh, really helps players kind of focus on these non-combative, because 5e some, seems to really tend towards combat, which is fine, but it, it, it can roll, you can roleplay fine in 5e, but it, it shines, it seems to want to shine more in combat, and, uh, and that's the kind of games that it wants to push 
most settings and games towards. So I really appreciate that Cubicle 7 implemented some rules for uh, audiences, for dealing, like if you go into Bjorn's house during downtime and you want to speak with him and try and influence him or gain him as a patron or something like that, uh, there's specific rules for how that uh, kind of plays out that feels very Middle Earthy. Like think of uh, in, the, in the movies when Legolas, Gimli, Aragorn, and Gandalf uh, enter Edoras, where King Theoden is, and how they, there's, it's a very formal greeting, Theoden's on his throne, um, one player from the group has to roll a traditions check, uh, and then they kind of play out the role playing, the game master, the lore master takes note of the motivations of the person they're talking to, how, how they want to be treated, what are their goals, and if the players kind of, uh, do things for or against those motivations, they get bonuses on their roles, which there is a final role at the end of the role-playing session, where uh, the, the players uh, make a final role, and depending on that result, based on the bonuses that they've received through the role-play session, uh, maybe they'll get them as a patron or get what they want from, from Bjorn or the leader or whoever it is they're talking to. So I really, I really like that. Uh, I like that he, the game is a lot more dangerous than regular 5e. So players can expend hit dice, but they do not recoup hit dice and they do not uh, regain hit points during long rests out in the wild. They have to be in, in a sanctuary and they have to open a sanctuary first before they can do that or have it offered to them by an NPC. They can't just camp in the middle of the woods for eight hours and regain all their hit points and hit dice. That can only be done uh, in, a, in the fellowship phase or at a sanctuary. Healing outside of sanctuaries is done through, again, the scholar's ability, so this makes the scholar class very important. Uh, gathering herbs like athelus and all these other sorts of useful herbs that you've seen and read in the films and books. And using those to make poultices, healing, healing ointments and things like that, which can be applied to wounds. Um, of course, you're free to ignore that rule if you want, but I, I think that this harkens back to a more old-school style of gaming. In, in old-school D&D, you only regained about one hit point a day, and you didn't just like rest, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're healed and better. So I really, I really like that as well. The only thing it didn't fix is, uh, and it's just a problem inherent in 5th edition, the way the stat blocks work and everything, is that everything is a damage sponge and hit points seem very inflated. <clears throat> The way I remedy this is I give my players uh, good weapons, pretty much. They're at level four, almost five at this point, and about two or three years into the campaign, in, in game time, not in real time. And uh, I've given them some interesting weapons that will hopefully help make them survive in combat, which means I can throw scarier stuff at them, or when they deal with orcs and goblins, um, I can make those creatures a little more deadly and uh, it, it can feel a little more, uh, combat can feel a little more deadly, you know. So that's my one gripe. They didn't really, I, I can't ex expect them to fix that. That's a problem that is, in my opinion, inherent to 5th edition, and there's not much you can do. I know there's a hardcore mode 5e that kind of removes, it, it reduces hit point pools by removing the uh, constitution modifier bonuses, to creatures, I thought about trying to implement that, but we're already like so far into my campaign that it, it seems uh, unfair to try introducing that at this moment now in the game. I should have that should be introduced at the beginning of, of any game you're going to run in this. But I think that 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 sort of uh, homebrew rule set could work really well with this iteration of 5e. Other things I like are. Um, Again, the presentations of the books are really well done. The adventures are, are well written. I like... The one thing I've noticed with official 5e adventures is that they, they give you very railroady sort of written adventures. And the Mirkwood campaign feels like very unique. It almost doesn't... They give you some battle maps and some encounters. But more often than not, it's just like a bullet point of like in, in this year, in this adventuring year, this occurs, and it might not even be occurring near the players. Like the players might be at, at Radagast's house in Rosgabel and over in Lake Town. This is happening. But if the players are in Lake Town and not at Radagast's house, then uh, they can experience this event over in Lake Town. So I really think that's cool. Um, 
I like the concept of patrons. I like that treasure is uh, and and loot is is modified in this. Gold is rare, but not as useful. Um, you're encouraged to reward players with holdings, with blessed artifacts and weapons, um, with sanctuaries, with patrons, um, all all sorts of things that are kind of more in a medieval setting rather than just like, here's 500 gold. Um, and, and you're giving out mad, they want to encourage you with like, uh, not magic items, but like blessed and enchanted artifacts and weapons because there's no magic stores in Middle Earth. Uh, players have to find or inherit or be given. And that, that's very true of like in The Hobbit, when they uh, beat the trolls, they find the troll cave with all the loot. And within those, they find the enchanted elven weapons. So you're encouraged to do that sort of thing rather than like, here's a magic shop and 500 gold, go have a spending spree on what, buying whatever you want. And I, I understand that within regular 5e and within a, a normal kind of generic fantasy setting, that's perfectly fine. But it, magic shops don't fit within Middle Earth. They just don't. So it's pretty cool that they encourage that. I, it just feels like a different flavor. It's more toned back. Uh, but combat is still fun, and the written adventures are a lot of fun too, and it's just a lot of fun uh, adventuring in Middle-earth and meeting some of the characters that you've see read in the books. Uh, you know, my characters have met uh, Radagast already, they've met Thran King Thranduil of Mirkwood, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, cool things that players can, um, can experience in these games. And I really appreciate that. So I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. There's a lot of things that I think um, that, fifth edition, that it fixes in 5th edition that I really appreciate. One final thing before we close out this video and my kind of perception on uh, adventures in Middle-earth is that uh, I like that, it, maybe some people don't like this, but you can't play an evil character. There is no alignment within adventures in Middle-earth. You are all good adventurers. You can be maybe a little selfish, obviously, but misdeeds within game earn you shadow points. And shadow points, if they exceed your wisdom, uh, can cause a bout of madness. And when that happens, you succumb to the shadow temporarily and you go through a bout of madness. The player surrenders control of their character to the, to the Lord Master, to the Game Master, and the Game Master describes some kind of action that the player character does in their bout of madness that they will, will regret, regret later. So say uh, they're traveling, traveling through blighted lands because blighted, blighted lands and you know tainted lands can give you shadow points as well. Think of like Frodo and Sam traveling through uh, Mordor and how those very clearly corrupted and blighted lands and how that really affected their, their spirit and endurance uh, spiritually as they traveled through Middle Earth. Think of it like that. So let's say a player character um, is traveling through blighted lands, their hit point, their uh, shadow points exceed their wisdom, and then something happens where it triggers a bout of madness. Uh, the GM would assume control of that player character and then maybe describe how the character is just like raving mad, screaming uh, in, in this you know dangerous place. It could attract enemies maybe, as an example. Or um, maybe uh, they run off um, towards something that entices them with their shadow weakness. Every player character has a shadow weakness, which might be a thirst for knowledge or power or something like that. And so they can be tempted with those sorts of things to do something maybe they would regret later. And they then get permanent shadow points. Permanent shadow points cannot be removed in um, sanctuaries or through healing of corruption. Temporary ones can, but not permanent ones. So kind of reminds me a little bit of a spin on the Call of Cthulhu system with uh, sanity points. That when your sanity points decrease, your character goes mad, has about a madness. It's very similar, except this one, you gain points. If it exceeds your wisdom score, then bad stuff can happen. So I, I really like that. It feels very Middle Earth to me, kind of like how Boromir was gaining shadow points. He already had some when he arrived at the, the meeting of the, of the Council of Elrond, but as time went on through the, the, through the adventure and the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, 
he accumulated enough shadow points to where it exceeded his wisdom score and he obviously tried to take the ring from Frodo. So very, very Middle Earth um, flavor to that. I really like that. And I like that it forces players to uh, be good players. I think if you're playing, if you want to play a Middle Earth game, Middle Earth has such a black and white um, moral code within it that I don't know why he'd want to play an evil character uh, in, in, in a Middle Earth ca themed campaign. So I think it fits it well enough and you know what you're getting into. You're not going to miss playing your evil warlock character or something like that. So all in all, I really love Adventures in Middle Earth. Uh, if you can find these books somewhere, I highly suggest you pick them up and run it. I think it fixes a lot of the problems that I have with um, traditional 5e. Yes, it's a low magic setting. Yes, you're not going to be able to be a wizard, but I think the benefits of other aspects of this uh, um, of this take on 5th edition far out, far out seeds the things that you're going to miss in vanilla, in vanilla 5e. So. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you got, got you interested in Adventures in Middle Earth. And maybe check out Free League's new second edition of The One Ring, which will be coming out. Um, it's The One Ring is really good, and I think uh, Cubicle 7 originally released it, and a lot of their what, what they based Adventures in Middle Earth on, as far as the feel, the lore, um, and a lot of those kinds of concepts, were based on The One Ring uh, tabletop RPG. So. I'm kind of excited for that to come out because finding uh, Adventures in Middle Earth books now, as well as the first edition uh, One Ring books, are expensive and really hard to find because they're not in print anymore. So, looking forward to that. But anyways, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Hope this was enjoyable. Keep rolling 20s. See you later.